guest musician is Cliff Beach. Thank you, Cliff, for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. And Kate Lear is going to be our woman reader. First, before we start those, if you have your smartphone with you, now would be the time to turn it off or turn it to mute, okay? Thank you. Kate? Good morning. Happy Friday. Good morning, Kate. Somehow I always get scheduled to read on this day, and it's a, uh, my dad died on Father's Day, so it's a, a rough day for me, but to all the dads out there, I have a classic poem, Only a Dad, by Edgar Albert Guest. You've probably heard it many times. Only a dad with a tired face, coming home from the daily race, bringing little of gold or fame, to show how well he's played the game, but glad in his heart that his own rejoice to see him come to, and to hear his voice. Only a dad with a brood of four, one of ten million men or more, plodding along in the daily strife, bearing the whips and the scorns of life, with never a whimper or pain or hate, for the sake of those who at home await. Only dad, neither rich nor proud, merely one of the surging crowd, toiling, striving from day to day, facing whatever may come his way, silent whenever the harsh condemn, and bearing it all for the love of them. Only a dad, but he gives us all, to smooth the way for his children's small, I'm sorry, doing with courage, stern and grim, the deeds that his father did for him. This is the line that for him I pen, only a dad, but the best of men. Our first hymn is hymn number 82, 
And we're going to sing both verses if you'll stand when you see them, number 82. Both verses. chances and times to use those gifts. Just keep in mind that every gift you have, whether it's the gift of art, drawing, producing, whether it's the gift of using your hands with the earth, it may be, um, I don't know, an insurance gift. 
<laughs> it could be a gift of teaching, of using your guitar. It could be many gifts. But think about those things you love. Thank God for them. And then use them. Remember it says the Spirit's given each of us a special way of serving others. So let's serve others with our special gifts. And take this time right now, even before we get to the blessings of the gifts later, and turn to someone around you and thank them for being the special gift that they are. Thank you all. 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 Thank you Right. We're ready for the Thank special you. gift that you are, so come on oh, up and give okay. us our musical <laughs> interlude. <laughs>
before we get ready to meditate, let's say a prayer for those who have requested that we do. Even if you haven't put someone's name on a piece of paper, feel free to raise that person up in prayer with us right now, right here. Gracious God, we thank you that we feel comfortable and welcome to bring before you special needs, special requests, knowing that you have provided the solution, the healing already. We thank you that you are our great physician. And that with you, all is well. Emotionally, physically, financially, and spiritually. We hold these special requests in our loving hearts, knowing that where you are, all is well. Amen. Now just get yourself ready for a time of meditation. And for a little while, let go of everything that you believe or perceive separates us. Know that right now we are all one. are all part of a loving family. I'm going to give you a few words, a few thoughts that I'd like for you to think about. Even say them after me in your spirit. Because I am, I am calm, I am strong, I am serene. Because of who I am, I am joyous, I am fearless. All that I am is eternal in God. And the God that is in the midst of me is mighty. Life, full and free, is flowing through me. This body is the temple of a living God. This temple is filled with truth and grace. Its substance is spirit. And my spirit is eternal and changeless. I rest in this truth. This truth makes me free. Come unto me, the divine within you, and I will give you rest. Rest from all of your false beliefs. Rest in the divine activity, which is always thinking in and through you, and doing this in harmony and peace. Come unto me. I'll give you rest in the divine idea, the perfect within you. 
I will help you to think it will be all good and such peace as you have never dreamed will enter your soul. silent moments to let all of that sink in, to let all of that resonate within you. quiet. Let us say our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which is in heaven, hallowed is thy name. Thy kingdom is come. Thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. You give us to us today our daily bread. You forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You never lead us into temptation, but you always deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and all the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm trying something new today. A couple of people have already come. That is, I'm using technology. I know sometimes when we want technology to work, it's when it doesn't. So, in your belief, would you please say a silent prayer and thank God for the working of technology? All right. <laughs> On Father's Day, there was this little boy who decided to take his dad breakfast in bed. Raise your hand if you've had breakfast in bed on a special day. Was it good? <laughs> well, he decided he was going to make scrambled eggs, toast, and coffee. What does dad like? So he brings it into his dad and hands him his cup of coffee, and he says, Dad, I worked really hard on the coffee. Try it. Try it, Dad. So, being a good dad, dad takes a sip, nearly passes out because it's so strong. But his little boy says, how do you like it, dad? How do you like it? Well, no dad wants to hurt his son's feelings. So he says, this is something else, son. <laughs> I've never tasted coffee quite, quite like this before. Of course, this little guy smiles from ear to ear and he says, good, then drink some more, Dad. <laughs> well, the strange thing is, Dad gobbles it down, but he notices some little army men in the cup. Just what he feared. So he says, hey, Dad, do you like it? And Dad says, well, sure, but um, why, why are there these army men in my cup? And the little boy smiles so largely, and he says, The best part of waking up is soldiers in your <laughs> <body."> <laughs> <laughs> He really, in his innocence, thought this must be the best way to treat Dad and honor him, is to put some soldiers in his cup. <laughs> well, I'm sure many dads will 
once they recognize themselves in this story, there was an eager little teenage girl named Kirsten who had gotten her learner's permit and now she needed to practice a hundred or so hours of driving. And after a while, Dad thought she's having too much fun with this. So the next time she says, hey, Dad, let's go for a drive, Dad gets in the seat behind the driver's seat. And she said, wait a minute. Why aren't you sitting up front with me in the passenger seat? He said, my love, I've been waiting forever. Since you were a little kid, now it's my turn to sit back here and kick your seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that brought back memories for me because I can remember constantly feeling kicked in the back, <laughs> even when the kids were in their little car seats, right? Well, being a good father has a few prerequisites. First, you have to be a good man. You have to take responsibility. You have to love God to be a good father. And I'm so glad when I think about this family here that we have quite a few good men. And let me remind you that being a father being father-like doesn't necessarily mean that you have children in your life right now. But I do want to share with you before we go any further the men's thesaurus. This is mostly for the ladies, Dad, so just sit back and relax. Ladies, please allow me to translate for you, for your future benefit, of course. When a man says to you, I would, I'm sorry, it would take too long to explain what's happening here, what he really means is I have no idea how this works. <laughs> if he says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, I think what he really means is, sweetheart, I can't hear the game if you don't turn off that vacuum cleaner. <laughs> or when a man says, that's interesting, dear, perhaps what he really means is, oh, sorry, you're still talking. <laughs> that's interesting. And if a man says it's a guy thing, what he means is there's no rational thought pattern connected here. <laughs> and you have no chance at all of making it logical. It's a guy thing. <laughs> when a man says, can I help you with dinner? Perhaps he really means it's I'm starving. Can we just get this dinner done? Or when a man says, I know, or you know how bad my memory is. What he really means is I can remember the complete theme song to Hogan's Heroes, the phone number of my first girl, and the vehicle identification numbers of every car I've ever owned. Oh, but yes, I did forget your birthday. Sorry. <coughs> and if a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal, perhaps what he really means is, I think I've severed a limb here. I might bleed to death, but I'm not going to admit I'm hurt, so please get over here now and help me. <laughs> All right. When a man says, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are, he really means no one will ever see us alive again. <laughs> A man says, no, dear, I don't think I can go today. <clears throat> I think he means to tell you that shopping is not a sport, and no, I'm never going to think of it that way. Hmm. <coughs> Men, don't we love them? We computers, don't we? All right, so enough of that. Let me start out again by saying to all of us here, Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And all those things that I said before were just jokes, of course. But really, Father's Day is a time when emotions may run high, like Kate talked about. People may gather at your house. 
all to pay honor to those strong hands that helped rock the cradle. As you may or may not know, the very first national celebration of Father's Day was on June 19, 1924, by proclamation of President Calvin Coolidge. But it all came about because of the efforts of a girl named Sonora Smart Dodd. She was sitting in church. It was around 1909, and she was listening to a Mother's Day sermon when the idea of Father's Day came to her mind because, you see, she had been raised by her father after her mother's death. And Sonora wanted her father to know how special he was to her for all his parental sacrifices and for being in her eyes so courageous, so selfless, and so loving. And to make a long story short, it took 25 years through her efforts <clears throat> that President Coolidge designated the third Sunday as June, third Sunday of June's Father's Day. And our nation is celebrating that. I'm kind of glad there's a Father's Day because, you know, Mother's Day, get a, we get a lot of hoopla on Mother's Day, don't we? We get flowers, candy, special treats. We claim we're not going to do anything that's called work. We just relax the whole day. So I'm glad that we have this chance to honor those who stand at the helm, who gather their team in a huddle, and who lead their family through life's battle. So I thought it would only be appropriate today to take a thoughtful look at the earthly father of the man we call Jesus. Let's take a look at Joseph. Now, the cast of characters associated with this story, the story of Jesus' birth, is colorful and it's memorable. We often recognize them by their unique speaking parts, with dramatic words. We have angels taking center stage to announce the birth. They appear to Joseph and announce that the name of the child will be Jesus. And the angel Gabriel makes the unforgettable announcement to Mary. And an angelic chorus erupts with singing, Glory to God in the highest. And then Mary, she has her divine selection here that humbles her and offers a beautiful hymn of praise and thankfulness in, in Luke. Wise men are desperate in their search to find the newborn king and prepared to present him with gifts of honor. Even the shepherds, like early evangelists, start telling everyone about the newborn Messiah. But oddly enough, only Joseph has no speaking part. He is the long, silent member of the cast. And often. just stay silent. There's no quotes from him. We don't see anything but maybe some silence. <clears throat> but his actions speak a lot louder than words could ever do. He is irreplaceable in this story. Though his silent actions, Joseph teaches us three valuable lessons about fatherhood. The first one is about righteousness. See, we get introduced to this man right in the middle of a personal crisis. Having become engaged to this beautiful young woman, he has worked hard to establish an income. He wants to support her. And he wants to begin a family. I believe he's in love. He's committed to her. And she believes that he loves her. And then he hears the news about his precious bride. He's heartbroken and betrayed, but how should he respond? See, he has friends and neighbors who say she should be publicly shamed. Turn her over to authorities. She could be stoned to death. They even say this pregnancy is blasphemous, where Mary says, there is a heavenly father. However, Joseph chooses a path of mercy. You know, this made me think deeply about my own father's situation. My father left pretty soon after I was born. And a man who did not know me, who did not help 
and the creating of me became my father when I was five years old. <clears throat> hmm. I wonder how many men are willing to do that. To father someone who is not their own child. Oh, hold up a minute. I wonder how many men we have out there who are willing to father someone who's like me in my 50s. Oh, it takes a lot of righteousness, a lot of love to do that. But you know, it hasn't been that long ago that I was fathered by someone here. Now I know that he thought he was being a good friend. Oh, sorry, that doesn't make noise, but it's very hard. But this man, who was being like our godfather, when I was very much in thought, very much kind of looking inward, overwhelmed with emotions, was overwhelmed with the beauty of the space that we were in, the place, pulled away from others and came and sat with me. Didn't talk a lot about much, a little talk, but there was the presence. Isn't that being a father? There was just the presence of I'm here. They're there. I have a friend who always says, I'll mother you, just come over, I'll there there you for a while. There, there. Well, that person was Rick. He just sat with me, talked with me a little bit. Didn't ask me questions, didn't care, I guess. Didn't care whether I was, you know, thinking about life or whatever it was. He just was there. And that meant a whole lot. See, the key to being a good father is first being a good man. I'm going to go even a step further. We often call God the Father, don't we? Sometimes here we'll say, Mother, Father, God. What if I said to you, being a good father being like the Father does not even have any reference to your gender. But I think the key to being a good father is first being a righteous and good man. Someone once said, the best thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Have you heard that? I have. Uh, well, that's what my dad did. He loved my mother so much. Now, I won't tell you any lies. I do not agree with this man's personal political views. I do not agree with my dad's way of thinking about a lot of people. But I'm eternally grateful that he loved my mother. There's a man named Steve Shepard, and he tells the story of a father and a son who went to the circus one day. This man says, When I was a teenager, my father and I were standing in line to buy tickets for the circus, and finally there was only one family between us and the ticket counter. This family made a big impression on me, he says. There were eight children, all probably under the age of 12. Now we could tell, my dad and I, that they didn't have a lot of money, but they were all dressed up in their best. They were all excited, and the children were well behaved, and they were lined up two by two behind their parents. They were excitedly jabbering about the clowns and the elephants and all the other acts that they were going to see that night, and one could sense that they had never been to the circus before. The father and the mother, he says, were at the head of the pack, standing as proud as could be. And the mother was holding her husband's hand and looking up at him as if to say, You're my knight in shining armor. And he was smiling, looking very proud of his family. And then the ticket lady asked the father how many tickets he wanted. 
he probably said, or proudly said something like, um, please let me have eight children's tickets and two adult tickets. The man's wife just let go of his hand when the ticket lady quoted the price. Her head dropped down a little, and my dad and I could see the man's lip even quiver just a little. So the father leaned a little closer, and he said to the ticket lady, um, excuse me, how much did you say? And again, the ticket lady quoted him the price. Well, it became obvious to my dad right away that this man did not have enough money. How was he supposed to turn now to his children and say to them, I don't have enough money for you to see the circus? Well, seeing what was going on, the man tells the story of how his dad put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a $20 bill and then dropped it on the ground. The man says, please keep in mind that we weren't wealthy in any sense of the word, but my father reached down and picked up the $20 bill and tapped the man on the shoulder and said, excuse me, sir, but I believe this just fell out of your pocket. Well, of course this man knew what was going on. He wasn't begging for a handout, and he certainly appreciated the help this was an embarrassing situation for him, maybe even heartbreaking. But he looked straight into my dad's eye. He took my dad's hand in both of his, and he squeezed tightly onto that $20 bill. And with a tiny little tear streaming down his cheek, he said to my dad, thank you, thank you. This really means so much to me and my family. Well, my father and I went back to our car and we drove home. We didn't even go to the circus that night, but we certainly never went without. And he says, I would say to all fathers, this is the kind of lesson, a lesson in righteousness that sticks with your kids. He said, my dad showed me what compassion and righteousness really are. Hmm. Well, back to the story of Joseph. You see, good Joseph gave this great plan some credence when he had a dream. The story goes that an angel appeared to Joseph in his dream and told him, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the baby in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people. Hmm. That's a mess. So the story goes on to say that when Joseph woke up from this dream, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife, and Joseph named him Jesus. Hmm. No, no. <laughs> I have commanded my computer to do that. And Joseph, believing in all that was good and in his responsibilities, even through cutting remarks of a child conceived prior to their wedding, he decided that he would obey in spite of the fact that this child of divine promise would be born perhaps under cloud of adultery. And yes, he called his adopted son Jesus, as he was told to do. Let me talk for a minute about responsibility. It was in 1960 that they figured out, these family psychologists and family life specialists, that 17% of children in the United States were raised apart from their biological fathers. By 1990, now we're getting closer to the year of my birth, that number had risen to 36%. But today, nearly half of all the children in the U.S. are raised without a father in their home. I'm curious to find out how many of you were raised without a father in your home. There are a few. So we're very familiar with how that feels and what it was like. We need to take responsibility, especially for children in their formative years. I, too, have helped raise children that were not my own. 
I once heard a psychologist say that whatever you plan on teaching your children, your values or morals, must be taught within the first five years. After that, he says, it's just a reinforcement. Now that's a huge responsibility. A few more statistics. The Holbrooks, who were family life specialists, had been lecturing and conducting surveys across America. And in a survey of, hundred, of hundreds of children, the Holbrooks came up with the three things fathers say most in responding to their kids. I'm very tired, took first place. I'm sorry, we just don't have enough money with second. And third was, keep quiet. I hope that that has changed a lot. Bo Jackson, a former professional baseball and football player, once said, having grown up with virtually fatherless, I know firsthand how much it means to a child to have a caring, loving, and involved dad. I know firsthand how much it means to a child it really means a lot, and I want to build self-confidence in my children and make them aware that they have choices. I don't want my kids to follow my footsteps. I want them to make their own. So I would say this as parents, not just fathers, but as parents. Let us put the remote control down, get off the couch a little more, and spend some time with our kids. It's taking responsibility even if your kids are four-legged. Let's take them to the park. Let's play with them. And let's bring them to church. Hmm. That's the last lesson that Joseph teaches us. Now, at first, I hesitate to use the word religion or to have a lesson in religion because a lot of times that word gets a negative connotation to it. But I certainly don't mean religion in a negative way. <clears throat> See, a lot of times we think that Christianity is a relationship, <coughs> not a religion. But that statement can be a little misleading because it sets up this false dichotomy. Because, yes, Christianity is about our relationship with God and God's people. But true religion is also about our relationship with God and God's people. In James, chapter 1, we find these words. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for the orphans and the widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Incidentally, James, who wrote these words, was also a son of Joseph and a brother of Jesus. The point is that Joseph was a devoutly religious man. And in Jewish culture, the father was not only the head of the house and the primary breadwinner, he was also the spiritual leader of the family. After doing everything the Lord's teachings required, Joseph and Mary, they became a family. The child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom. And God's favor was with him. You see, Joseph knew the Lord and his teachings through his religion. And he obeyed everything in the law of Moses to the best of his ability. There's a man named Austin Sorensen who said a very interesting quote that I'd like you to think about. He said, a child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. So let that thought seek in for just a minute. He says that seeing God in their father is a child's best way to come to know God as their father. He said, when my wife would be at work, on many bright sunny days, I would pack both the kids into the double wide stroller and we'd go walking through the neighborhood, sometimes for hours. And while I walked, I talked. While I pushed, I prayed. Passersby, couldn't hear the words coming from my lips, probably thought I was just talking to the kids. But the kids knew. They knew that I was talking 
to God. I hope that my children never forget the sound of their father's voice praying. He says, I pray with them every night because I want them to see and hear what my relationship with God is like. I want them to see the Christ in me. See, dads, maybe more than anyone else in the world, you're the one able to instill faith in your children. You, maybe more than anyone else, are able to show them what a loving father looks like. Maybe you, more than anyone else, can give them the ability to trust and depend on their father. But you can't give what you don't have. You have to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And when you do, they will see that. One final funny story. Actually, it's more sweet than funny. <coughs> a preacher once asked the preschoolers in Sunday school to draw pictures of God. I've done that too in, in our own Sunday school once. Very interesting what you get. See, this minister, he wanted to use these pictures as an illustration for a Sunday sermon. So, toward the end of class, the children were excited to come up into the sanctuary and show him their work. They came up with rainbows, and there were some men with these great big hands, and finally the preacher's daughter showed him her picture. It was just a man with a suit and a tile. Dad just looked at her kind of confused, and she said, Daddy, I don't know what God looks like. So I just drew a picture of you instead. So what can we learn about from a man who really never said anything? Even though none of his words were ever recorded in the scripture, Joseph's example teaches us some invaluable lessons in fatherhood. And to all the righteous and responsible and religious dads here today, thank you. Thank you for showing us what it means to be a good man. Thank you for always being there when we need you, even if we're 50. Thank you for loving God and for making us one of your sake. Whether you're a father or not, whether you had a loving father growing up or not, you need to know that you have a father in God who loves you and wants nothing more than for you to be a part of this great big eternal family. So happy Father's Day to all of you. Will you pray with me? Most gracious, loving Father, thank you so much for the wonderful men who have fathered and will father still yet those in their circle, their realm of influence. Thank you, dear God, for the people here whether male or female, who show us the Father love, who are shining examples of the Christ. And thank you, dear God, that when people think of what you look like, they see us. <coughs> May we be the Father because you are the Father. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right. Mr. Peach. Oh, Father. Your turn again. <laughs> Father's Day, all you dads. <coughs> it's kind of a day for new arrangements, uh, Rick. Uh, 
seem to click on that without knowing it. <laughs> Shall be no more, and the morning breaks turn up bright and fair. When the saved of us shall gather over on that other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Oh, when the road, when the road is gone, yonder I'll be there. When the road is gone, yonder I'll be there. Sunday in July, 
Uh, as you know, we're going to have a memorial service at the Columbarium right after a preacher service. Uh, Maria will be doing that. All the children will be in that weekend, so we're going to do that service um, on July the 1st, right after the service. <coughs> Bless you, Dale. I wanted to take the, uh, again, take an opportunity. I try to do this as much as possible to thank everybody for everything that they do around here. Uh, this week, and especially, I want you all to, to look again outside. Uh, Martha and Velvet and uh, Tammy and others have worked outside and put down mulch, and it really looks good. Yeah. And, yeah. And so, everything that gets done around here, sometimes it doesn't get mentioned, but uh, everybody <coughs> around here does something. As Melanie said, everybody has um, a talent, and whether it's digging dirt or whatever it is. And so, uh, it's all important, and we really do appreciate everything that everybody does, whether it's putting out toilet paper or whatever, so we really appreciate it. So uh, take time to, to look around and, and thank people for what they do. We really do appreciate everything that everybody does. Uh, the flowers are there for Father's Day, so everybody take some, especially your flowers. Be sure to take some and uh, enjoy them. Uh, I know that uh, I just wanted to say this week is, uh, I had some people that uh, uh, had some struggles in the uh, a lot of times we um, get irritated with people when uh, they kind of aggravate us, but <laughs> uh, just, uh, I, and I brought this to my attention this week when I had uh, an issue with somebody at work, and uh, people go through struggles that we don't know. So just have patience with them sometimes, uh, I sometimes to let that <clears throat> pass by me, and I try not to do that, but uh, just remember that uh, if somebody irritates you, maybe they're going through something you don't know about. So. I have a little more patience with them. And now, uh, come next door and eat. If you rise, hymn number 98, both verses, You Are Mine. Oh, yeah. Hymn number 98, both verses. <laughs> Oh, 